Hey, good morning, ladies. It always seems so loud right at first. Woo. Okay. How are you this morning? Good, good. Okay, I just wanted to comment real quick on um, a couple things regarding your study guide. They had you look up a lot of verses just like they did last week. And I hope as you're looking up these verses that you are growing a foundation of God's word, that you're using these wonderful scriptures they're having you look up, especially in the back to basics section. Uh, and you're highlighting those in your Bible or in your Bible app. Um, I, I just... I can't emphasize enough just the importance of knowing God's word. And this is such a fantastic uh, section, I think, on chapter four, where it talks about when you are facing conflict in your life, there's some wonderful go-to scriptures. Okay, so last week, we left Nehemiah, and he had overcome King Artaxerxes. And of course, we know that he did that by the gracious hand of God. And not only that, but he got the whole enchilada, remember? Um, the king funded his whole trip, and then he also sent him the cavalry with him. And we talked about that being an example of Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. He was given abundantly more than he could certainly ask ask or hope for. And then we remember too that he kind of just waved off the troublemakers and he reminded the people that it was the God of heaven that would give them success in that rebuilding effort. And then this week, I want to focus on three things um, that I just really loved. I want us to look at the diverse group of people here and how they all work together for a common goal. I loved the um, looking at the gate, so we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But what's not in your study guide that I studied is the spiritual application of those gates and how they um, in turn apply to each of us in our lives, how we can apply it. And of course, we're gonna look at his leadership skills and his wonderful strategies. Nehemiah had some skill for sure. Um, one thing too is a wise leader is gonna recognize that they cannot do the job themselves. So Nehemiah gets to work by delegating those responsibilities and relying on the people around him. And I don't know about you, but sometimes as women, we sometimes think, you know what? It's just easier to do the job myself than to delegate the work. Uh, I can hear that amen around here. But what happens is when we hold too tightly to the reins, we're being prideful. And we are believing that, um, you know, nobody can do it better than we can do it. A wise mentor that I had years ago told me, never deprive your children of the blessing, the blessing of doing work. And I think for you mamas, it's so important that you teach your children at a young age that they matter and they're expected to pitch in and help. Lately, it seems like I've heard of way too many um, children that are in college and they go off to college and they don't even know how to do their laundry. So mommy and daddy are paying for a laundry service for their little precious children to be picked up and delivered. And what we're doing is we're setting our kids up for failure. So what if they have pink underwear? Who cares? I have boys, so they had pink underwear. Anyway, so let me get started by opening us up in prayer. Father God, we come before you this morning, Lord. Um, I'm just excited um, at what you've allowed us to study, your holy, precious word that is without error, that teaches us, Lord. Um, it rebukes us too, Lord, in our pride. It counsels us. So Lord, I pray that you would do that this morning, that you would teach us um, alongside of one another, help us to learn from one another, help us to cement these truths in our hearts and minds, Lord. So not only are they useful for us, but that they would extend to our families and those around us, and we would have a great impact for your kingdom. So we lift this morning up to you. I thank you and I praise you, Lord, that you show up and that you are here and you go before us and you hem us in. And it's in your precious name, amen. Okay, so the first thing I want you to do is open up your Bibles 
And we're gonna take a look at this diverse group of people, open up to chapter three, and be honest, how many of you, when you were reading chapter three, your eyes just sort of glazed over, okay? You're reading all of these names and all these details in this gate, and they did it next to this person and that person, and you're thinking to yourself, can anything be more boring than reading this group, um, this long list of these people? I can't even pronounce their names, let alone being far removed from them. And as one pastor said, it's kind of like tearing out a page from the Hebrew phone book, which is pretty much what it was. And we're tempted to skip over these um, chap- over this chapter, but you know what? God has it here, so he has something for us to learn. And then I, y'all need to be praying, I remember to. There we go. Okay. Now, The first thing um, he does, or that I'm going to do, is I want you to look at the diverse group of people. There was the high priest, the fellow priest, the sons of various people mentioned, the men of Tekoa, there were goldsmith, perfume makers, rulers, women, Levites, guards, and merchants. And did you notice in verse 5 that there were slackers too? It said that the men of Tekoa came, but the nobles would not put their shoulder to the work. And doesn't it always seem like when we're working in a group that there's always some, some slackers and they just kind of want to ride on the coattails of everybody else's work. But did you also notice in verse 27 that those slackers built an, another section of the wall? So that speaks to us because it also tells us that sometimes we have to make up for those slackers. We have to pitch in and do just a little bit extra. And we need to remember that God sees those slackers, but he sees us doing the work he's calling us to do in the kingdom. He's um, also reminding us that there should be no spectators in the kingdom of God. We should all be co-laborers that are working together. So Nehemiah, he has this great work ahead of him. It's going to require a lot of organization and delegation. And a favorite quote of mine is that organization gives me the freedom to fly. I think Nehemiah probably knew that too, because he mobilized an entire community of people, not only to work together, but they did it harmoniously. That's a miracle. I mean, think of that. Think about how hard it is just to get your family to church on Sunday, and then, or to unload the dishwasher. He's got all these people that are working together. It lists 38 different individuals and 42 groups are identified. And those are only the ones he's talking about. This is a lot of people to organize and delegate to and to motivate. And how did it say that the people worked? They worked shoulder to shoulder. This one, next to this one, next to this one. And some worked near their homes, that was a strategy. Um, Nehemiah knew that it was wise for these people to work their, near their homes because they would be invested um, in protecting their families and they knew that it was a benefit. He also had them working close to home so there wasn't a lot of wasted time commuting. In case of attack, as one of the tables said, they would fight to the death for their families. So that was a wonderful strategy. Then he assigned some of the tasks based on vocation. Did you notice that the priests worked right by the sheep gate where the animals were brought in for sacrifice? So Nehemiah, we see that he's a wise delegator, organizer, and planner. And that in turn should speak to us because whether you are working inside your home or outside your home, you should take that job seriously. You want your homes and your jobs to run smoothly, which means that you're gonna have to plan and organize and sometimes delegate to get the job done. The organized plan along with the work ethic of the people allowed them to complete this project in 52 days, it tells us in chapter six. We'll get to that. But um, But what is it that motivated them? Nehemiah gave the people a grander vision. What did he tell them in chapter two in verse 17? He said, come let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. Remember the Gentiles, they were mocking them. They were ridiculing them because of the condition of the dilapidated walls in Jerusalem. So essentially they were actually mocking God. And this should be a reminder for us that the purpose of our ministry in our churches and the jobs we do is to bring glory to God. 
And how are you doing that? How are you doing that by pitching in to make sure that your church is running smoothly, whether it's here or whether it's in another church or even your home? Okay, let's consider all the different kinds of people that he used. Who does he start with? He starts with the priests because they were the leaders in the city. And if anybody should be leading, it should be them. The high priest used his consecrated hands that were not usually meant for manual labor to pitch in and do the work too. Then he mentions the men of Tekoa. These guys were commuters. They came in from about 15 miles away. And then, like I said earlier, we've got the goldsmiths and the perfume makers. And again, those perfume makers, these guys have soft hands. They're not out doing the hard work, but they put their hand to the plow as well. And then in verses 9 and 12 and 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, all talk about the rulers who were ruling over the people, but they got into the grind as well. A great leader never asks or expects the people that are working under them to do more than they're willing to do themselves. In fact, they should be doing more. Did you notice that they mentioned the daughters? The women got in there too. They got in there and worked alongside the guys. They pitched in. The phrase next to him or next to them is mentioned 26 times. It's kind of like a big jigsaw puzzle. Each piece, each person was unique in and of themselves, but they were interconnected for a larger, more beautiful mosaic picture. And isn't that the picture of what we should be in our churches today? 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says, we are one body with diverse parts. And when we work together, what do we get? Ecclesiastes 4, 9 tells us that we get a good return for our work. There's power in that cooperation. And what about the gates? This is where I got really excited, I have to tell you. So most of the commentators, they focused in on the practical meaning of the gates, um, but I want us to look at the spiritual application and how it applies to our lives. Yay, it worked. Now, can y'all see that? Well, I certainly can't see that one, but I hope you can at least see this one. If not, you want to pull out your um, study guide and look maybe on page 127. <clears throat> okay, let's find the sheep gate at the very top. Okay, remember, this is where the priests um, were working. This was the gate that was used to bring the sheep in that would be sacrificed. And this gate should remind us of Christ. Isaiah 53, 7 says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before his shears is silent. He did not open his mouth. That prophecy was fulfilled at the cross. And we, ladies, we begin at the sheep gate because this is where our life begins as Christians. Christ is the sacrificial lamb that took our place and paid the penalty of our sin. Now, this is what's interesting. In John chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus first identifies himself not as the good shepherd, but as the gate for the sheep. So the sheep enter through this gate here at the temple, and it is a one-way gate. No lamb ever came out after entering the temple to be slaughtered. They were sacrificed for the sins of the people, which we know points us forward to Christ. In the temple, the sheep went in towards death, but there's a way out for us. In John 10, 9, it says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and they will go out and find pasture. He goes on to say in John 10, 10 and 11, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. Jesus, ladies, is our way out. He's our savior who rescues us from death. As we continue counterclockwise around the wall, the next gate is the fish gate. And this is where the fresh catch of the day came in. 
In the Old Testament, this is a symbol of witnessing to others. And we know that this applies to us because we're called to be fishers of men. And this is what we do when we witness to others and we share the truth of God's word. Next, you'll see is the Shoshana gate, which also means the old gate. This represents the old way versus the illusions of error, the new illusions of error. So what is the world trying to tell us about God's word? What are professing Christians trying to tell us about God's word? They're trying to reinterpret it and set and bring it more up to date, more current. But the problem is that God's word says it never changes. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is the word. He is unchanging. And when men try to change the word of God to meet what they think it means, really what they're doing oftentimes is they're justifying their sin. But the old gate, it calls us back. Jeremiah 6.16 says, Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient path. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. A great prayer that you can pray for your children is Isaiah 30.21 that they would hear the voice of the Lord behind them, whether they turn to the left or to the right, that says, this is the way, walk in it, so that they're not, um, you know, they don't succumb to the lies that the world is saying about what God's word says that's unchanging. So next we come to the valley gate. And this opened to the valley below. And a valley in scripture often represents humility and judgment. And John Stott says hum, uh, about humility, it is the rarest and fairest of Christian values. The world applauds pride. But what does God applaud? He applauds humility. And next we see that we have the dung gate. Any wild guess what this may be for? Well, we know, ladies, and it's not a great name. However, it's an essential process of our life, isn't it? How do we apply this to our lives, though? Well, we talked about last week the importance of confession, and that that's one way to rid ourselves of the defilement that we have in our hearts and in our minds. Another way is to be careful what we allow in. We have to eliminate the things that corrupt us, and we do that by recognizing that what we read, what we hear, what we listen to, and what we watch has the potential to defile our minds as well as our bodies. James uh, Boyce points out that this is the gate of elimination. And 2 Corinthians 7, 1 calls us to rid ourselves of the filthiness of our flesh and our spirit. He goes on to say that one of the reasons that we don't function well as believers is because we seldom use the dung gate. We don't deal with our secret sins and we don't spend enough time in confession and rid ourselves of the sin in our lives. We don't do that and then we don't receive the forgiveness and the cleansing that we have through Christ. And guess what? When we don't do the, use the dung gate, what happens? We begin to stinketh, ladies. Next is the fountain gate. Probably this is where the fresh water was brought in. And this describes to us the work of the Holy Spirit. It reminds us of when Jesus says in John 7, 38, whoever believes in me, streams of living water will flow from within. This is the spirit-filled life. And your study guide talks about that a little bit too. And it comes from knowing and abiding in Christ. And did you notice that the dung gate, did you notice that it comes right after the dung gate? Well, that's because that's when we confess our sins, then the cleansing of the Holy Spirit washes us clean. Next, we have the water gate, nothing to do with Nixon, but this is where Ezra reads the law of God that we'll see when we get to chapter eight. 
And in the word, water is a picture of the word of God. So this gate reminds us of the importance of being in God's word on a daily basis. And you may also notice that there is no mention of repair for this gate. Why? Because the word of God is without error. It does not need to be repaired. It never needs improvement. It is indestructible. And God's word tells us that we are to live by the word of God. Next is the horse gate. And the horse is always a symbol of battle in scripture. And this reminds us that life is not a cakewalk. It's not about roses and kittens. But what does Jesus tell us in John 16, 33? He tells us that in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Next is the east gate. And if you look at the diagram, you'll see that it's the uh, opposite of the temple on the map and it's facing the rising sun. It speaks of hope and expectation. It is believed that when Jesus returns, that he will enter through this gate into Jerusalem. This gate tells us that God has glory awaiting those who trust and believe in him. Then we come to the inspection gate or called the muster gate. And the word in Hebrew means the appointed place. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed appointed unto man once to die and after that judgment. In other words, the inspection. This reminds us that we all give an account of, of how we've lived our lives. For believers, this will be a time of rewards. 1 Corinthians 3, 8 tells us that each man will be rewarded according to his own labor. No, it does not mean that we earn our salvation um, because of works. We know that we are saved by faith alone and Christ alone, but we are rewarded for what we have done in service to the Lord. And then finally, we're back at the top at the uh, sheep gate. The cross is where we begin our real life, and it's also where we end our life. In the presence of the Lamb of God who took our sin to the cross so that we could spend eternity in heaven. And you know I'm going to ask you, if you don't know that, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, please ask one of us to take you out for coffee. If you have questions, we'd love to spend time with you. Well, just when things are kind of rocking along, what happens? The people are working feverishly. And if you open up to chapter four, we're gonna see that the troublemakers are back on the scene. So look with me at verses one through three. And I'm gonna take a drink of water while you turn to that. When Nehemiah heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore the wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from these heaps of rubble burned as they are? And then because every bully has to have a sidekick, Tobiah kicks in and he says, Wow, what what are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it could break down their walls of stone. It's kind of sounding a little like junior high at this point. But truth be known, these guys were threatened because of the success of Nehemiah. You know, if things had not been going well, they could have cared less. But their power is being threatened here. And success can be threatening to some people just because they're so afraid of that loss of power. So these guys start to heckle. Nehemiah, which is more psychological warfare like we saw in the last chapter. Remember that Goliath used the same tactic against David to intimidate him and then Christ too. He was mocked and ridiculed uh, when he, during his trial and when he hung on the cross. And we have to ask ourselves, why is ridicule so powerful? It's because it hurts our pride. It hurts in here. Wearsby said that some people who can stand bravely by when shot at crumble when they're laughed at. And ridicule has, when it has a thread of truth in it, like it does in some of the things that they're saying here, it makes it even harder. Let's take a look at these questions a little closer. 
What are those feeble Jews doing? The word feeble means withered and miserable, and they were both. Remember, they're working night and day to complete the wall. Will their wall be, will they restore their wall? How can this feeble group of people hope to rebuild a wall that is strong enough to protect this city all the way around? They probably had those questions in their minds too as they're working. How could they hope to reassemble all these huge heavy stones and get them back into place? And then will they offer sacrifices? What this implies is is that it's gonna take more than prayer and worship to rebuild the city. Now they're questioning God and questioning whether he was going to be there for the people. And they're thinking, is God going to be here? We've attempted this before, but we failed. One commentator said, it's like saying, are those fanatics going to pray that wall up? It's their only hope. Now they're taunting their faith as well as their God. Will they finish in a day? Of course not. The Jews knew better than that too. They knew how difficult the job was that they were facing. And what about those stones? Will they bring them back to life from the heap of rubble burned as they are? Of course not. But that's how ridicule works. It tears us down. Nope, the stones won't come back to life on their own. And they weren't burned anyway, like they said. That's a lie. It says that the gates are burned, if you remember. But the stones were tumbled, not crumbled. So what they were trying to do is to defeat them by ridiculing them. Now Tobiah pipes in. What what they are building, ha, a fox could uh, break it down if he climbed up on it. Now these taunts from a human perspective, like I said, there's some truth to them. And they were weak and they were poor and the work really was too big for them to accomplish. Demoralizing people is an effective tactic We're getting to watch it in all the political debates. We all have those hidden insecurities, don't we? And what does the enemy do? He seems to know exactly where to strike us, to weaken us. But what those hecklers didn't realize is who was on their side. The God of heaven is the one that made all the difference that would give them the success. And what was their response as this table said over here? They knew it was prayer. Uh, Look at verse four in your Bible. They say, hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them as plunder in the land of captivity. So Nehemiah is basically asking the God of heaven who called him to this job in the first place to be the one that would fight the enemies that they were facing. And what do we learn from Nehemiah's response? Well, he didn't respond. He didn't retaliate. He did not lower himself to their level. He prayed again and again. He turned to God. And this is good because he didn't keep everything bottled up inside of him either. He poured out his heart to the Lord. His prayer resembles what we call imprecatory prayers that we see in the Psalms. David has written a a ton of those. It's those Psalms that um, invokes judgment or calamity or a curse on one's enemies, I'm not recommending that. However, Nehemiah knew that the rebuilding of the wall was God's work. So what he was doing is he was turning all of this over to the Lord and leaving it in God's capable hands because he knew who was behind the rebuilding. He unburdened himself to the Lord instead of losing his cool. And you know, that would have really delighted those enemies to see him completely blow his top. Boyce said, this is valuable because anger is seldom productive and it's usually a hindrance to good works. In addition, prayer restores our perspective. I want to say that again. Prayer restores our perspective. And finally, he just went on about the work. He knew that the taunts were based on fear and that they might, the fear that they might succeed in rebuilding the walls and that their little kingdoms that they were so concerned about might come tumbling down. These governors wanted that complete control, and this was a threat to them. But Nehemiah also knew they had King Artaxerxes on their side. He had the letters, and the the king was funding this. So he knew that these guys would basically slit their own throats if they came up against them. Nehemiah knew that, but he was still wise and listened to the fears of the people. 
And here we are, Valentine's week, verse six. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height for the people worked with all of their heart. And I see a lot of red out there today. And I love that. They just worked with everything they had in them. And this is a great picture for us of what teamwork and dedication can do. And since the psychological warfare didn't work, they said, well, we're just gonna switch tactics here. We're just going to threaten them with some violence. Verse 8 says, if you look down at your Bible, that these bullies were plotting against them to come and to fight and to stir up trouble. Yes, Nehemiah prayed, but he realized that fear is paralyzing, and he also realized it could be contagious among the people. He not only listened to their fears, he came up with a great strategy. Verse nine says, but we prayed and our, to our God and we posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Prayer and practicality. I love that. I'm, very, I'm a very practical person, I think, most of the time, probably too black and white, but I'm pretty practical. But the people, they were tired and they were halfway through and they knew they still had the other half to go. The excitement that we have, have you ever had that at the beginning of a project? You're excited, you're on board, and you're ready to get started, and then you're halfway through and you're thinking, am I ever going to finish this? I know I have. So now Nehemiah, he's going to start getting opposition from, not from the outside, but from the inside, from the ranks. Verse 10 says, meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. It's that old, I can't see the forest for the trees. All they see is the rubble. They don't see how far they've come and their pride is a little tarnished. They're wounded. And then the threat of violence against them and their families is great. And then their enemies say in verse 11, before they know it or see us, we're gonna be right there among them and we're gonna kill them and we're gonna put an end to their work. And then if that's not enough, the Jews living nearby keep the rumors going and with all their yang yang. And you know, if rumors are repeated enough time, what happens? People start to believe them. So verse 12, it says, then their neighbors came to reinforce their fears. They said 10 times over, yep, wherever they turn, they're gonna attack us. Don't you love that? When you're down and out, you have people in your life and they just heap on the negativity. Do we all have somebody like that? I do. Um, but we need people in our lives that point us back to the Lord, not give support to the enemy. The enemy will oppose you through whatever means is possible. So we need to be careful and we need to watch the people in our lives. Are they building you up or are they tearing you down? Do they eat chocolate when you are dieting? Do they have a margarita when they know you are struggling? Or tear down your husband or your children when they know that you are working to build those relationships to reinforce and maybe even restore. Satan will use any means and any people possible. If you are putting up a brick, the people around you should be putting up a brick with you. Look at Nehemiah's strategy. It says in verse 13, therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords and spears and their bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your children. Ladies, as believers in this world, we are swimming upstream in this culture to fight for our families, and we need to fight the good fight. We need to know what our weak points are, and we need to be aware of the people in our corner. You should be having people that tell you to fight. Focus on the Lord. Remind you that fear is from the enemy, but that God is great and awesome and powerful. Verse 16 says, when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot, now they knew they were busted, and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. 
Did you notice it said they returned to the wall? Fear of their enemies actually stopped the work. It stopped the progress of restoration. And that's exactly what the enemy wanted. He wants us to stop. He wants us to be so paralyzed by fear and the circumstances in our lives that we are rendered completely ineffective for the kingdom of God. They left the wall. They gave in. They quit. Have you ever felt like that? Parenting is too hard. I quit. This marriage is not worth trying to save. I quit. Why do a good job at work? Nobody sees any way. Who cares? You feel like quitting. But one of the verses in your lesson from 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says, The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those who are committed to him. I love that vision. He is, he's looking, he's watching, and he is strengthening those of us who are committed to him. Then Nehemiah, he institutes more strategies in verses 16 through 19. What does he say? Half of them did the work. The other half were equipped to fight in case, just in case, these goobers were crazy enough to come and fight against them. It says the officers posted up behind the people, so they had their back. They knew they had some reinforcement while they were building. And those who carried the materials, they did it with one hand And they held a weapon in another. Can you imagine? They got their tools and they got their weapon and they're ready. And then they have a sword at their side. This is my revelation hammer from my revelation study. It used to be completely gold. Somebody gave it to me, but I've literally used it enough. I've worn the gold off. I want us to remember that Jesus is our Prince of Peace. It tells us in Isaiah but he's also described as our conquering warrior. It tells us in Revelation, we too need tools for building and swords for battling. And what are your tools? We have prayer. We have the sword of the spirit. We have the word of God. We have hymns of praise and we have a community around us. I love what Warren Wearsby points out. Worship is warfare. And Jesus, I love this. Jesus worshiped before he went to the cross to battle against the enemy. Right after Jesus' last supper with the disciples, he tells us in Matthew 26, 30, he sung before they went out to the Mount of Olives. That's right, ladies. He raised a hallelujah in the presence of his enemies. We need to remind ourselves and others of that too. What a great God we serve. We need to be those singing soldiers who build and battle at the same time. Note in verse 18 where it says, the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with Nehemiah. Now this is an important detail because it tells us in verse 20, whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, you join us there. In other words, don't fight alone. They were spread out and they needed a signal so that they could regather. So again, who is on that journey with you, helping you restore those places in your lives and where you might have those cracks? Hopefully you've got somebody praying for you, holding you accountable, blowing up your phone with scripture and encouraging you. But the most important thing that Nehemiah said was, our God will fight for us. Nehemiah is rallying the people. He's reminding them to fear God, not man, and to fight, to fight for their families. And this, again, applies to us. We have to fight against what the world says is okay for our kids or our family or our marriage, especially if it's against the word of God. And the even bigger picture here is that they were fighting for the future of the nation. And what is a nation made up of? Families. And where does the enemy most readily attack? The family. So we need to be careful. I imagine that each of us is probably facing our own battles. I will tell you that after I committed to um, teaching this study in Nehemiah, the thought came to me, what in the world am I doing? Because I have a battle going on in my own life. Um, 
a relationship that needs restoration and rebuilding. It's not my husband. (laughs) He's safe. But a relationship with somebody that I really love. And I told you guys last week or a couple weeks ago, we cannot change the heart of another, but we can certainly pray for that person. So a wise friend told me, you focus on the eternal things that God is calling you to, and you leave the temporal battle to him. Satan would much rather have me and have you wringing our hands in worry and trying to fix things that we don't have the power to fix rather than trusting him. And I can tell you that my struggle, it's been real. It's been going on for months. Um, But I have struggled with the weapon of prayer in one hand and the word of God in the other. And some days are just hard. But God's word reminds me of who he is and he has all the power that I need. So anything that keeps me or keeps you from doing what God is calling you to do, it helps and aids the opposition. So you keep fighting. You keep, you may feel like you're swimming upstream when you live differently, ladies, when you don't join in on maybe some of the things that are going on, the gossip or the criticism and things that are going around. Uh, Maybe your boss is calling you to do something unethical at work. Honor God first. In verses 21 through 23, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, that's exactly what the people did. They were basically sleeping with one eye open. It says they stayed in the city during the night with guards, and then they worked during the day. Did you notice they didn't even get to put their PJs on? It says that in verse 23 that they never took their clothes off. And I'm thinking, I would be so sad. That's my favorite time of the day when I get to put on my pajamas. And they even carried weapons when they get to when they went to get a drink of water. Wow. So we have to have the same heart and mind that verse six has. What does it say? Work at whatever God is calling you to with all of your heart. Maybe it is strengthening your marriage. Maybe it's restoring a relationship like me. Maybe it's being a more patient mother. Maybe you're faced with an addiction. Maybe it's not participating in gossip. Maybe it's setting aside that quiet time that you know that you need to have with the Lord each day. Whatever it is, your perspective matters. We often quit because we don't want to endure the pain to make the progress. It's a lie, ladies, that you can have progress without pain, that you can have marriage without struggles, that in spite of Facebook, you can have perfect kids with no problems, or that you can grow spiritually with no effort. Progress will usually, will always require some pain. What resolution have you given up on? And how do you need to take a closer look at the people around you who are influencing your life? Do you have that community? Are you building a community around you to support you? Let's remember where Nehemiah puts his focus on the greatness of God. He looked through the lens, not, he looked through the lens of God's greatness versus through the lens of the problems that they were facing. And it's the same approach that David took when he was faced with the giant Goliath. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. What if Jesus would have given up? This is just too hard. These people are hopeless. They're stubborn. They're just a bunch of hard-headed sheep. But thank goodness he endured the cross, the pain and the suffering that we needed to be restored to a right relationship with him. Let me pray. 